We turn now to the scriptures, and today we consider God's word as it comes to us in Psalm 13. Psalm 13, you can find it on page 436 in the Pew Bibles. It's a short psalm, and we're going to read uh, all six verses. Psalm 13. Please listen carefully. This is God's word. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death, and my enemy will say I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you that you are a good and a gracious God that you are always with us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have paid the price for our sins and have made us to be your people. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have inspired these words of David and that you have preserved them so that we can read them today. And we pray that as we look at them, that you would open our hearts and our minds to understand, to believe, and to obey, and to praise you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the book of Psalms is probably the most well-known book in the Old Testament. It was written over a period from about 1440 B.C. to about 400 B.C. The oldest psalm that we have is probably Psalm 90, which was attributed to Moses. And one of the latest, Psalm 126, was written after the return from exile in Babylon. For comparison, the Trinity Hymnal, which is published by the Presbyterian Church of America and the Orthodox Presbyterian Church jointly, contains a hymn written before 400 AD and one as late as 1982. And if you have that Trinity Hymnal, number 641 is this psalm, Psalm 13, set to music. Now, the book of Psalms is divided into five books. The first book, which is Psalms 1 through 41, is largely the Psalms of David. Some of the Psalms have titles at the front, which tells us the occasion for which they were written. For example, Psalm 3 and Psalm 34 have such titles. The Psalms, as you move from the beginning of the book to the end, tends to move from laments to praises, and it's interesting that Psalm 13 does the same thing. We see that progression from consternation to calmness. One commentator well summarized the character of the book when he said, the Psalter, which is another word for the Psalms, the Psalter rather is primarily a manual and guide and model for the devotional needs of the individual believer. It is a book of prayer and praise to be meditated upon by the believer that he may thereby learn to praise God and pray to him. So let's look carefully now at Psalm 13. And I urge you to keep your Bibles open since we're going to go through verse by verse. And to help us understand the psalm, let me suggest to you the following theme, purpose, and outline of the psalm. The theme is that even when we think God has abandoned us, he has not and we praise him for that. The purpose of the psalm is to rescue us from despair, to remind us to focus on God and not on our circumstances, and to cause us to rest joyfully in him. And then the outline, which we will use to go through, the first two verses we see the cry of perplexity, David in pain. The next two verses, the cry of petition, David at prayer, and then finally, the cry of praise, David at peace. Now, remember that these psalms are poems. Now, they they may not rhyme the way many of our English poems do, although modern English poems don't seem to rhyme at all, but they are poems nonetheless. And in the original Hebrew, the first two verses contain five lines, 
The middle two verses contain four, and the last two verses contain three lines. So the structure follows the content of the psalm, that is a movement, as I said before, from consternation to calmness. As one commentator said, the song, as it were, casts up constantly lessening waves until it becomes still as the sea when smooth as a mirror, and the only motion discernible at last is that of the joyous ripple of calm repose. So let's look, first of all, at the cry of perplexity, David in pain, the first two verses of the psalm. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? First of all, we see that David's cry arose from real circumstances. Now, we don't know the exact circumstances which caused him to write this psalm, but think of what David endured during his life that may have given rise to this. If you remember, he was promised the kingdom at a very young age. He was anointed by Samuel to the kingship, and yet he was fleeing for his life, being chased by Saul, the king, with the intent to kill him. During that period, 1 Samuel 27, 1 records this thought of David. One of these days, I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. David echoes Job's cry in Job 13, 24. Why do you hide your face and consider me your enemy? David is more concerned that God seems to have hidden his face than that his enemies are in his face. Yet, David still asks God, how long will my enemies triumph over me? Four times he asks him, how long? David is in deep distress. But notice, this is not the cry of unbelief or despair. David is in pain. He is perplexed as to why God seems to have left him. But notice that he turns to God, not away from God. You see, if David didn't believe that God had his eye on him, why would he pray? His prayer would be pointless. As one commentator notes, it is not the accusations of a false witness, but the persistent plea of a friend that provokes the cry. David asks God if he will forget him forever, but in his heart, he knows that God will not do that. God has made precious promises to David, promises in which he trusts. Marvelous promise of God that he gives us in Isaiah 49, and there was an allusion to this in the first hymn that we sang today, Arise, my soul, arise. Listen to these words that God gave through Isaiah to the people who also were feeling forsaken, from Isaiah 49, 14 through 16. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me, God has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. God will not forget his children. Secondly, our cry of perplexity can come from real circumstances as well. James Montgomery Boyce, former pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, noted that from his many years of counseling experience that the feeling of abandonment among Christians is far more prevalent than you might think. Yet it's something that we don't admit. It's something that we don't talk about. But David here does admit to it. And so we can and should talk about it. Look at the four how longs. First he says, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? His struggle has continued for a long time. When we undergo or experience lengthy struggles, that can cause us to feel abandoned by God. Notice the second how long. He says, Why, how long will you hide your face? The former blessings that he had seem to have been removed. One of the parts of the high priestly blessing of number six was that God would turn his face toward his people. 
But what about when God seems to have turned his face away from his people? Perhaps your marriage has deteriorated into strife and unhappiness, and you wonder if God has withdrawn his former blessing. Or children, perhaps you are experiencing conflict with your parents or with your brothers and sisters that you didn't before, and you wonder if God has withdrawn his former blessing. Or perhaps work or school, instead of being a joy and a success, has now become stagnant and frustrating. Or perhaps your spiritual life has fallen from a vigor and a freshness that it had before and has grown into a slump and you wonder if God still cares about you. These and other circumstances can cause us to cry out as David did. The third how long. He says, how long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? He's wrestling with dark thoughts and emotions. Do you ever experience those at times? I do. I'm sure that you must as well. They can be caused sometimes by illness, especially if it's a long and lingering illness. It can be caused by fatigue, by disappointment, or a host of other circumstances. And finally, the fourth how long, David asks, how long will my enemy triumph over me? Now, David had real enemies. You may encounter abusive or exploitive people, those you once considered your friends who have turned their backs on you. But even if you don't have any real physical enemies, you still have a powerful enemy in the devil and his minions. So the question arises, why do we face these trials? Why do believers face such trials? David had real enemies, enemies who pursued him with the intent of killing him. I, on the other hand, simply am petulant sometimes with minor inconveniences, and I think of them as trials. Yet we can face actual trials at times. One of the first questions we should ask ourselves when facing trials or feelings of abandonment by God is, is there a particular sin in my life that has caused this? Why has God seemed to turn away from me? God's people do at times suffer, sometimes because of their own sin, sometimes because of the sin of others, sometimes simply because God is testing them. Look at what David endured. Look at what Job endured. Look at what the prophet Jeremiah endured. So when you're undergoing a time of suffering or feeling abandoned by God, ask yourself, why? If it's your own sin, repent and turn away from it. If it is because of other sins, forgive them and bear with them. If it's because God is testing you, trust him and endure it. Finally, Jesus is with us in our trials. Dear friends, you can't go through these times on your own. You need the help of someone stronger and greater than you. Jesus told his disciples in Luke 24, verse 44, that all of the Old Testament, including the Psalms, points toward him. As one commentator wrote, whenever David or the Davidic king appears in the Psalter, except where he is confessing failure to live up to his calling, he foreshadows in some degree the Messiah. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 1 ascribes Psalms 45 and Psalms 102 to Jesus, Psalms that for the original hearers were sung to Yahweh, the God of Israel. So the Psalms are songs to Jesus, and as we sing laments, for example, we are encouraged to turn to Jesus for help and for comfort. Furthermore, in Hebrews chapter 2, the writer of Hebrews has Jesus actually singing the words of Psalm 22, verse 22. So as we sing the Psalms to Jesus, he sings them along with us. Notice the similarities between the first two verses of Psalm 13 and the first two verses of Psalm 22. Let me read Psalm 22, verses one and two. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, 
but I find no rest. Do you hear the similarity there? There's a difference, though. God had not really turned away from David. But on the cross, God turned away from his son. And because he did, because he poured out his just wrath for sin on his son, he will never turn away from his beloved children. Brothers and sisters, as you go through trials, as you at times may feel abandoned by God, be assured and comforted that the God who gave his own son for you will not forget you. He will not turn away from you. Hear this promise from God and the response from Hebrews chapter 13. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? We turn next to the middle two verses of the psalm, and we see here the cry of petition, David at prayer. And we note, first of all, that David's source for help and hope is God. After crying out to God in the first two verses, he now turns and pleads with God in prayer to aid him. Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. Again, if David were not convinced that God had his eye upon him, his prayer would be pointless. The ground of his plea is his faith in God, not in himself. This here, this is the turning point, the pivot of the psalm. This is where we move from distress to delight through prayer. And notice how the four how longs of the first two verses are mirrored by his four requests in these two verses. In the beginning verses, he says, in response to how long will you forget me, Lord, he now asks God to look at him. In response to God's hiding his face, he asks God to answer him. In response to his dark thoughts and sorrow, he asks God to strengthen him. And in response to his concern that the enemy will triumph, he asks God not to let that happen. In other words, he says to God, recognize me, respond to me, revive me, and rescue me. In the same way, our source for help and for hope is God. In verse 3, David asks God to answer him. Elijah, in 1 Kings 18, also asked God to answer him. If you remember, the people of Israel were wavering back and forth between Israel and ba between uh, God of Israel and Baal, trying to worship both. And Elijah is finally saying to them, enough. If Baal is God, worship him. But if God of Israel, Yahweh is God, worship him. And so they set up two altars, one for Baal and one for God. And as Elijah says, the God who answers by fire, he is the true God. And we note what happens in, starting with verse 37, as Isaiah, I'm sorry, as Elijah is finishing his prayer. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. God is the God who answers. He is there, and he is not silent. He will answer when we call. A word to those of you here who have not yet bowed your knee in repentance and faith to this God. If you are going through trials, you are going through them alone because God is not your help and your hope. If you feel abandoned by God, it's because you have abandoned God. Turn to him today for salvation. Trust in him. Trust in Jesus, the only savior for sin. Admit that you are a helpless sinner that cannot save yourself. 
and receive from God all that you will ever need. He will give light to your eyes and life to your soul. As we saw in the first two verses, Jesus is with us in our trials. We now also recognize that Jesus has endured far more than we will ever endure, and he will enable us to endure. Notice the following words from Psalm 22, which all four of the gospel writers and the writer of Hebrews apply to Jesus and his suffering on the cross. Verses 12 through 15. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. And notice as well how verses 19 through 21 of that psalm also are similar to verses 3 and 4 of Psalm 13. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild ox. Can you not hear Jesus crying out to his Father from the cross for victory over sin and death and hell and the devil, for victory and absolution for all of his children. Praise God that he answered that prayer of his beloved son and did raise him from the dead to seal that victory over sin and death and hell and the devil. Dear brothers and sisters, whatever you are enduring now, whatever you have endured, whatever you will endure in the future, Jesus, your Savior, has endured even more. Furthermore, as your king, he has conquered all your enemies. As your priest, he has given himself the sacrifice for your sins and continues to intercede for you. As your prophet, he reveals to you the will of God for your salvation. He will recognize, respond to, revive, and rescue you. And then we look finally at the last two verses of the psalm, and we see David at peace, the cry of praise, David at peace. David is no longer now questioning. He is no longer petitioning. He is now expressing his trust and his confidence in God. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. We see here, first of all, that David rests and rejoices in God. Notice verse 5. He says, I trust in your unfailing love. David trusts not in the quality or the quantity of his faith. He trusts in God, in the object of his faith. It is God's love, not David's strength, that is the foundation of his trust. In fact, look at the verb tenses of all of them in the last two verses. Because God has been good to him, past tense, David is trusting in him, present tense, and David will praise him, future tense. David prays as if he has already received the answer to his prayers. He has such utter confidence in God's character, in his covenant, and in his blessings. Question, do you pray like that? Do you pray with open eyes, looking to God alone to supply all that you need? Do you pray with an open heart, asking God to know you intimately and cleanse you from sin? Do you pray with open hands, waiting expectantly for his gracious answer and blessing? Secondly, as David rested and rejoiced in God in the midst of his trials, so we too should rest and rejoice in God our Savior. We who have the full light of revelation, who look backward to Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, instead of forward 
as David did, how much more do we know of God's amazing grace than David did? How much more should we trust in him and in his love? The Hebrew word that the NIV translates unfailing love in verse 5 is the word chesed. It refers to God's steadfast, merciful, binding, covenant love. It's the same love, in fact, the same word that God used in 1 Samuel 7 when he expressed to David a promise that he would never take away his love from his son, that he would establish his throne, his kingdom, and his house forever. And as he does with all his promises, God kept that promise. That promise is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, David's son, yet David's Lord, whose throne and kingdom will never go away, will endure forever. And because of that, all believers, all who trust in him, experience and enjoy God's covenant love. Again, for those of you here today who have not yet trusted in God as your Savior, you too can receive this marvelous love. Hear these words from the book of Isaiah where he makes this promise. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you will live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. The last statement of the psalm, that God has been good to David, is also echoed by the writer of Psalm 116. We just read three verses from that psalm. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. Think of David being pursued by Saul at the cost of his life. Think of Job and all that he endured. Think of Daniel in that den of lions. Think of Jonah in the belly of the fish. Think of them all crying out to God and God hearing them and God rescuing them. Believer, God has been good to you as well. Rest in him and rejoice in him. Those of you who have not yet come to God in repentance and in faith, do not rest until you do. Do not rest until you confess your sins and your helplessness to him and receive his pardon and his salvation. Finally, we, like David, can be at peace because Jesus gives us rest for our souls. Hear this promise that Jesus makes to us in these familiar words from Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Remember how I said that David sing or that Jesus sings the Psalms with us? Well, if we look once more at Psalm 22, we see a similarity in verses 22 to 24 to the last couple verses of Psalm 13. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. As our Savior sang those laments of Psalm 22 on the cross, he entrusted himself to his loving Father, confident that he would hear him, that he would raise him from the dead and complete that work of redemption. Can you not hear the singing Savior as he bursts forth in triumph from the tomb on that glorious resurrection morning, now freed from the cross, now alive again, the risen one, the first fruits of 
of resurrection. Can you not sing along with him that he is the Lord of glory, the King Almighty? Dear believer, suffering or not this morning, God has been good to you. Hear these familiar words from the epistle of Romans from chapter 8. Verse, starting with verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? And then skipping down to verse 38. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. David trusted in God's chesed, his steadfast, unchanging, binding, merciful covenant love. God has given you that same love if you have trusted in him for salvation. Once more, those of you who have not yet trusted in him for that salvation, come to Jesus the Savior so that you too may sing his praise and you too may tell of God's goodness to you. So in conclusion, what should this psalm say to our minds, to our hearts, and to our wills? How can we apply this part of God's word to us? As we leave here today, what difference should it make? First, what should we understand? We should understand that the believer at times experiences pain, problems, persecution. We should understand that the believer can go expectantly to God in prayer. And we should understand that the believer can rest in God's character and in his promises. Second, how should we behave in these times of distress or when we feel abandoned by God? Examine ourselves to see our sin and confess it. Turn to God with expectation and call on him. Remember his goodness and exalt him. Finally, how should our hearts be affected? Believe that God has not and will not desert you. Trust that God has been and will be your deliverer. Rest and rejoice in God's goodness. I close with these words from James Montgomery Boyce. If you are suffering from a sense of feeling abandoned by God, which is what this psalm is about, I cannot tell you when the emotional oppression will lift, but it will lift. The curtain of your despair will rise, and behind the veil you will see the blessed Lord Jesus Christ, who has been with you and has loved you all the time. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are a faithful covenant God, that you love us with an everlasting love, a love that will not turn away from us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you gave your life on the cross for your people, that you endured far more than we could ever even conceive of, and you will enable us to endure under persecution or distress or feelings of abandonment. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for working in our hearts to enable us to understand these things. And we pray that you would seal them to our hearts, that we might rest and rejoice in our Savior this day. And it's in his name that we pray these things. Amen. Our next song reminds us that, as Steve, as Steve said, um, when we don't experience the rescue we long for, we can trust in the promise that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He will help us to endure and will hold us fast through every trial, pain, or suffering that we might be experiencing. Mm -hmm. 